Hello, welcome to uh, Love Rugby League Weekly. We're back. It, we have been missing for a few weeks, uh, partially down to, I think, my other commitments, it would be fair to say. I'm Dave Parkinson, delighted to be alongside the gaffer, James Gordon, and Drew Derbyshire. It's been a while since we've done anything together, Drew. How are you, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing very well. It's, it seems like an age ago now, Dave, since we was working at, at Lee together, but I think it's only, only, you were only two years or so. You were, no, no, you're lying. You were knee-eye to a grasshopper. Yeah. You've, you've just, I see you've took on a big uh, growth spurt since then. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we thought that we'd be back and uh, we'd return by looking at the Challenge Cup final. Big, big game, this. Um, your thoughts, first of all. I suppose these, in, in regards to Catalans, no one expected them to be there. No, well, yeah, I suppose at, at the uh, at the Bolton Double Harbour, obviously everyone was expecting a, a St. Helens victory to an extent, I suppose. You know, Saints have won a lot of games this season and um, Catalan turned them over, they did a real job on them. Um, and, and to be fair, at that, I suppose that performance is what makes this weekend's game so interesting, I guess, because you probably wouldn't have said when the draw came out that a Warrington Catalan final would have been competitive, um, especially the way Catalan started the season. But certainly that performance against St Helens was was probably a culmination, to be fair, of the progress that that Catalan have made and um, and the improvements that they've made over over the season. Um, it's interesting, obviously, Catalan have had a couple of weeks, haven't they, where they've they've dropped off a little bit since the since the semi final. You could argue Warrington have done the same. Well, Warrington did the same last week. Yeah, it's just whether. There's now a little bit of pressure on them. I think. I think they went into the semi-final. There was not a real pressure on them because nobody expected them to to beat Saints. Whereas now people are starting to ask the question a little bit. Oh, can you know? Can Catalan do it? Can Can Catalan do it? Not just for themselves, but but for French for French rugby league as well. Uh, it's it's going to be a massive challenge because War- Warrington are going very well this year. I know, I know the fourth in the Super League table. I think they, they could have been a little bit higher if, if it wasn't for uh, the, the cup run that, they, that they've gone on. Castellans, what, what a magnificent job Steve McNamara has done. He, he had a lot of critics earlier on in the year. I, admittedly, I was one of those. But, I was one. But, was but, one. but when, he, when he pointed out, I think it was in his press conference when they lost at Warrington in the league the first time, not the Super 8s, in the actual regular campaign, he pointed out that they didn't have a proper uh, full pre-season because of the World Cup, and they had, they had I think it was nine plays in total in the in the French squad. So they have have to obviously give them time after the World Cup. So they had holidays, etc. So they only came back late in training. You look and at they, guys like Willie Army, who was then, in Fiji exactly, as well. Don't so you? they had Willie Army, and they had uh, Samisoni Langi and Sam Moore David with, Mead with well. Tonga, David Mead. They had so many World Cup players, Mickey McAloran with Ireland. So they had so many World Cup players. Give it us a couple a, of minutes, we'll slip another couple it, of names <laughs> in. Probably. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but they had so many, and they, did, they didn't have a proper uh, full pre-season. And if you look at teams like Wigan this year, they, they're excelling because a lot of their players managed to have a full pre-season. I think Sam Tompkins said it was his first full pre-season in, in about eight years or so. And look, and look how he's playing this year. So it just shows what a a full pre-season can do. And I noticed she got a mention for Sam Tompkins in there again. Tell he's oh, from Wigan. You hey, can tell he's from Wigan, can't hey, you? Don't be, don't be like that. Man, you, he is, he is going to be excelling for Catalans next season, isn't well, he? Exactly, but that, that was just an example of what yeah. a full pre-season it, can do. Uh, yeah, I've, I think I think Tompkins, I think, is a good example of a of a player that's that's kicked on from having that rest. You know, that try set up on, on Saturday was a, a real corker. And obviously, you know, Catalan, a win... This week could really set them on a on a real upward curve, especially after what happened to them last season as well. Um, you know, a couple of exciting signings coming in, and uh, they could kick on. Steve McNamara, I think I, I remember speaking to him for quite a bit at the uh, at the season launch back in January, um, and he seemed quite assured. Uh, you know, I he came in last season, they struggled. I think they only beat Lee, I think, in in Super League, and then you know they lost. They lost the rest of the games he was in charge, and then the only you know they scraped past, they scraped survival didn't they, in the million pound game. Um, you know they weren't up to any great shakes, and I suppose I, I was you felt like McNamara would be under pressure. And to be fair, the way that they started the season, it was like like you say, I think most people had, had written him off. But I think, I think it was two two wins in eleven. Yeah, so I think season. most people written him off. But I think I think the thing with McNamara, and, and I had this conversation with him, is his. He's a good fit for a longer-term project because mm-hmm. 
because he's been around the national team, he, he sort of understands the importance of developing players and, and bringing French players through. Now, you know, whatever your opinion is on whether Catalan have done that enough or not over the years, there's almost like two sides to them as a franchise, if you like. There's the producing players and, and bringing players through. You used that then, dreaded F-bomb yeah, word, and, didn't yeah. you? Franchise. And, and, and obviously being successful on, on the pitch. Um, it'd be really interesting if they could do it this week, just to see what sort of reaction that would get in France. I'm, you know... Potentially, Toulouse have still got a chance of getting promoted as well. Could you imagine if, in six weeks' time, Catalan are the Challenge Cup holders, and we've got two French teams in Super League? You know that. You know everyone talks about expansion and whatever your opinions are on on what's going on with various things. That would surely be a positive step. Let's back up a bit because uh, you've both already hinted at it. You saw quite a bit of Catalan's early doors in the season, and let's be honest, they were dreadful. They were, they were, they, they, they didn't know how to score points. I think was it the, their opening game that they lost. The witness yeah, Vikings that. put forty points past them in the. In the that was like game. almost a false dawn because the, the two were, teams have gone well, in exactly, different directions, exactly, haven't they? Because at the time, I was thinking Dennis Betts. He's won three games out of his opening four. I think it was, and we're thinking, well, is it can, can witness get top six this year with, with the way they were going on? And they, they've obviously spiraled downwards, and it's been the, the complete opposite for Catalans and. But you, you, like, like James alluded to before, the signings of Josh Drinkwater and Kenny Edwards, mid-season was, signings, they have been unbelievable for them. I was going to ask, because elsewhere there's a lot been made of Josh Drinkwater. He's a player that I saw a lot of. And I'll be truthful, he's playing fantastically well for Catalans. He seems a real good fit for them. He seems to be taking a lot more control of games than he ever did at Lee. Uh, I know that he's already commented elsewhere that he's getting more of the he's getting more of the ball, so he's been made that pivotal role. Do you think that that suits his game then? Hundred percent, because it, and, and let's face it, the the pack that Catalans have got, it's arguably the best in in, in Super League on its day. Whereas Lee's, it was a, it was a pretty weak pack, and it it was in a weak te- weaker team because th- there was floating around the bottom of the Super League and, and that'll certainly help an half-back. An half-back wants to play behind the likes of Sam Moe um, and Mickey Mack at, at Ucker because they're the best. They're, they're the best in the comp at, at the moment and that's certainly what's helping drink water in the arms. It, and, uh, and the fact that I think he's just got this free roam ability at Castellans. I think that's what Steve McNamara has given him. He's, he seems to... I don't know, he's, he's just enjoying his rugby. He doesn't have to be all, always organising because Mickey McLaurin does that from, from dummy half. Do we think that Drinkwater's going to play alongside Matty Smith next season? Do we think that's a, a I, see, I don't know because I keep, I, keep, I keep thinking, will it actually happen now because... I know, there, I, know, well, yeah. exactly, I know there was the talk of Matty Smith going for next season, but that was earlier on in the year when they'd only just signed uh, Josh Drinkwater. So I think because, uh, if, I mean, if, if Drinkwater can sa- sign a new deal, maybe for the next season, maybe for the for the the coming seasons, the, the next two or three years, then I, I don't see really the point in getting Matty Smith. Because, as I'm I mean, I always thought I always thought Lange was a bit of a strange one to be to be. Basically saying he's going to be the six. I, I always thought that he's a was. Be- a, he's a better centre, I yeah, think. Yeah, than and I, think he is I, a, a I thought that was always quite strange. But then in many ways, is the fact that he's a bit more structured and a bit more of a a runner rather than a playmaker, is that better for Drinkwater? Because it then means that. That suits them because yeah, in, yeah. in a lot of ways, uh, him and Ben Reynolds, who were partnered at Lee, they've got They're very similar, play, yeah. similar and, games. And that's the thing if, if Drinkwater plays with Matty Smith, he might, not, he might not be able to, you know, he might not be able to do that. You might not be able to take on that full responsibility. That, that Again, I feel that we're sort of like we're getting excited about next season, and why not? You know, because Catalans this time last year they didn't know what division they were playing in. They they were either going to be folding up and quitting at the end of September, weren't they? Or, or they were going to be celebrating like they did and putting a, a team in Super League again. They've none of those worries now. They've uh, been able to to step on. The next big thing for them is actually getting to Wembley and winning. Yeah, and you know we should. We'll have to talk about Warrington in a minute as well. But I think it's a big occasion. Um, Warrington have been there and done it. You know, it's the what is it the fifth final in ten years, something like that. I bussies, aren't um, they? These cup finals for yeah, Warrington. So I think that's the. I mean, it's, it's Steve Price's first. And, you know, there'll be a lot of players playing in their first. 
probably you know, I felt there was still a handful left from from the previous wins. But I think Warrington have got that. I know it's a bit cliche, but they've got that big game experience that maybe Catalan haven't got because Catalan haven't been there. You know, they were there ten or so years ago when they lost to Saint Helens. Um, so. You know how much of an impact will that have? How much of an impact will it be? It'd be interesting to see what the crowd's like because certainly in the in the semi final it was like everyone who didn't support St Helens was supporting Catalan. Right. Okay. And if they if if that happens on Saturday at Wembley, it could actually turn out really well because sometimes you know obviously, I mean there's a lot of debate going on about the crowd and we'll probably talk about that a bit later on. But we always like to encourage neutral. Followings, I suppose, to, to the cup final and stuff. And if it's if it's Wigan against Leeds, there'll be probably a lot of fans who are probably a bit like they don't want to cheer for either. Whereas Warrington and Catalan, it might be that people side with Catalan just because they're an underdog, aren't they? Yeah, they're they're underdog. You know, they're not. They've only got three and a half thousand fans there, so it's not like they've got masses of support. And it depends on how they play as well. Don't get me wrong, because if they, you know, the thing with the Saints was, it's because they started well. People sort of thought, oh, hang on a sec, they might do this. And that's when people bought into it and, and really got behind them. To be fair as well, I mean, Mark Aston, I was chatting to him the other week and he was saying, oh, obviously it's 20 years since uh, Sheffield had that big, big, Cup upset against Wigan and did particularly well. And I'm, I'm sure John Key is still living off a lot of what he gained that particular day, in, in all honesty. Um, but he was saying, you can't write off Catalans at all. They're in a very similar sort of position in the league to how Sheffield were. And he said there's a lot of similarities between those teams because I suppose you've got the, the man in the middle controlling it in Drinkwater, that's your Mark Aston. You've got your your dummy half controlling it. They had, uh, I think it was Johnny Lawless who was running from dummy half. Very similar sort of nuggety player, I think, to McAlorum. And then they just got big forwards everywhere. And you've also got to remember as well that Warrington are nowhere near the level that Wigan were in 1998. Um, you know, there's not... Although Warrington are, you would say, a better team, you know, on paper or... You know, based on the Super League season so far, but Warrington aren't. You wouldn't say Warrington are miles better than Catalan. Yeah, Warrington will be favourites, but you know they're not miles better than Catalan. So it's it's just going to be interesting to see the the forward battle because I think if Catalans blow their opposition away like they did with Saint Helens in that first half, that the absolute they storm through Saint Helens in in that first half, and if they do that against Warrington, then I can only see a Catalans win. But if Warrington play it to the wider areas in in the field, to, because look at look at Warrington's wingers, Tom Lineham and Josh Charnley, two very prolific try scorers. If they can get the balls either side to one of them, it looks as though Ryan Atkins is back as well. It's, he's another. Is that boost. not? Is that not a? Uh, you're taking a chance there because he's not played for weeks and weeks and weeks, has he? A m- massive chance, massive chance on Ryan Atkins. I didn't actually know until a couple of days ago that he was, that he was back fit. I think he only saw his tweet yesterday saying he, he passed his fitness test. So, so it is a little bit risky. And I'd feel a little bit sorry for Toby King because he's he's received a lot of stick this year, but in this last month or two, he's he's been electric for Warrington and he scored a couple of nice tries in that centre spot. So it's going to be interesting to see the team selection. And obviously, Sisaleki Akoala, I think I pronounced it right. Um, he's, he's not going to be playing, and he's another massive player. He's, he's probably not hit it off as much as we thought he would this year, but he's still one of Warrington's biggest players, and he could have helped match that Catalan's pack. So he's going to be a big mess. I think. I mean, I think. So I think you're right about Toby King. I think him and Charnley have, have developed a little bit of an understanding, and you've seen a few, certainly in the cup semi-final, even where you know he got in good positions and helped cause a bit of problems for um, for Leeds and I think it, like I say it's, it's a shame for anyone to miss a, miss a cup final I mean Ackwell the, the tackle um, that, that's got him suspended seems a bit a bit harsh to me but um, you know would it would they have picked him anyway maybe they would have I know he's not he's probably not an automatic in the 17 but given the size of the Catalan pack um, he might have got a go Um I think Mike Mike Hoops had a really good season, and you know him and Chris Hill are going to have to take it to Catalan basically. Daryl Clark, I think that's it's going to be really intriguing to see how the style of Daryl Clark against McLaurin 
pitches out because Clark's been pretty hot this year. And um, well, according to his coach, he, he's going even better than James Roby at St. Helens. So that must yeah, be that after a really, really yeah. good. Point. And, and I think the thing is with Clark is he enables you to get it to those wider positions because if you've got a broken, if he's quick out of dummy half and you've got a broken defence, it's a lot easier for them to spread the ball out wide. What Warrington don't want to be getting into necessarily is a bit of an arm wrestle down the middle because. Like we've said, Catalan's pack's massive. Warrington's strengths are probably that they can get it out wide to the to the back, the, you know, the wide running back rows they've got, the centres they've got, the wingers they've got, and get and get it out there. Um, you know, another thing from Warrington is, is Ratchford as well. Is how much of a how much of an impact is he going to have? Connect, it's going to, it's going to be interesting the the, the, the fullback battle between Tony Gijo and, and Stefan Ratchford because well, you mentioned Gijo and ultimately you could almost say I'll, I'll race you with Josh Drinkwater and took a, to- a Tony Gigo in there because he's just been so instrumental to everything good about Catalans in this run, hasn't he? He's a match winner at the end of the day, isn't he? He can produce anything from from absolutely nothing, to, and it, he's been another one who's who's been kind of like a mid-season sign because he weren't there at the start of the season, was he? I think he came back was it in March or something when when he got cleared. So he came back and, and he's been magnificent for them. So And to be fair, even the wingers have been great this year for, for Catalans. Well, since, since they started this rich reign of form, Fubu Jaha, Luis Tierney, they've, they've, they've been great for Catalans. And they can go into this, this game with absolutely no pressure on the shoulders whatsoever. And that's really dangerous, isn't it? Because if you've got nothing to lose and just everything to win, you can just chuck everything and leave it on the pack. Whereas Warrington... All the pressure is on them, really, isn't it? Yeah, I was going to say, obviously, you two are going pro-Catalan with all the Catalan talk. Well, no, actually, I think uh, that Warrington's going to win by 20 no, points. We'll come on to Warrington we'll, 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 we'll Dave's put his eye on the line. I just think, <laughs> I think it's, I think, um, yeah, you're right. I mean, Catalan have got more to gain, if you like, than, than, than Warrington have. But I think in some ways it sort of helps Warrington a little bit because everyone's talking about Catalan, aren't they? And no one's really... Talking, I mean, people are talking, but I think it's actually helped Warrington that Catalan are in it because it's almost like everyone's almost bigging up the whole, you know, the romance of Catalan being there and the French connection and you know BBC. Well, you know, yeah, the, because the BBC, if if, if, if Saints were, were still in it and, and not Catalan, then obviously Warrington would be the underdogs then, yeah, and, and everyone would be speaking about Saints and the pressures on Saints. So what? I think like, yeah. Like so I, I, I mean, I, and I don't think I don't think I don't think people are putting a lot of pressure on Warrington because I think. I'd, 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 you know, if Warrington were to lose, is it that bad of a result for them? I'm not obviously everyone doesn't want you know you don't want to lose a cup final. Well, it's, it's like two losses on the trot for Warrington. The, 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 they'll be getting twitchy, won't know, they? But, no, into but, back but, into but, the eight. But being serious though, I think if Warrington were to lose, and I you know I'm with you, Dave. I don't think that they will lose. But if they were to lose, would it be a terrible result? It's not. I don't think it's a Wigan versus Sheffield type. No, game because see, I don't because think we'll I think, get one of them uh, games. I think Catalan, are, you know, Catalan are strong. Catalan should be competing. You know, the level of players that they've got. You know, there's been that salary cap controversy thing this week. Where they're at in terms of their team and where their franchise sits in the grand scheme of things, they should be competing for these finals. And to be honest, if you look at you know what are they in thirteenth season now in Super League, they've only made one Challenge Cup final in that time. You know, have they underachieved? That's a question that you could potentially ask. I think. Well, they've, they, they've always had the the home and away battle, haven't they? They've, naturally, they've always been strong. Arguably, before before the last eighteen months, they, they've always been strong at home, and, yeah. and, and in teams of dreaded. Well, I think that's never going to. They're never going to change it's, it's, that. Yeah, but it's the, it's the away games because when, say, if you're a, you're a fan of a, a Wigan or Warrington Saints, and you you always thought that if Catalans were coming to your place, and it's it would be an easy two points, but that's, that's changed. And that, But that's something that they've got to address because it's never going to change unless they move. They're always going to be there because it's, you know, it's Catalan. See, I think, for me, it's 13 years in. You can't hide behind the excuse, oh, well, the French lads don't like to travel in. I don't think you can hide that bit. I think if you look realistically now, if you look in, by the time Catalan reached 20 years in Super League, they're going to have had to have got to a, at least a couple more finals. I recall having a conversation with you last year when you went over to Catalans and the fact that they'd almost given up yeah, uh, which is quite worrying when you're putting this and saying, well, you know, let's look at them in, uh, when they've reached year 20. Do you feel that they have now got themselves back in order, that there are the young players that are coming through, the, that they are? Because I, I, I'm with you. I think, actually, they have underachieved. 
I think I, I think it, I think I think it's hard for them because and I, and that's why I think I'd love to lose to get promoted because I think that would make a massive difference because it puts pressure on Catalan then because it's then there's two teams fighting for the best French players or the best overseas players to go to France. Catalan will want to finish above to lose. They don't want to be second fiddle, and I think, I think that would. I think it, I think it's a great time. And like I said before, it'd be magnificent for French rugby league if Catalan were to win this weekend and then Toulouse were to get promoted. Because I just think Catalan are almost they're flying the flag on the road. They're almost like we're all like, we're all sat here waiting for French rugby league to be able to compete with England. But you know Catalan can't do it all, and they've got to compete at the end of the day. You know, look at the flat West Wales are getting now. West Wales are getting loads of flat because they're getting absolutely pasted every week because they're using Welsh lads. They could do what? And lads t- who were at Gloucestershire last year. Yeah, they have well, got well, sort yeah, of four but, or five but, of those kids. But the as point, well. the point being, Dave, that they could just, you know, no. You know, they could just like other teams are importing English players or. But we don't know whether they're going to go down this route next year because they've got an Australian coach coming in. He well, might want to well, go down they that. They might route, do that, but they, but that their their hand will almost be forced because of the criticism that they've got. It's like if Catalan blooded a full French team and we're getting battered every week, everyone would be like, "Oh, get them out, get them out." Whereas they've had to do it this certain way, you know, because they need to compete. You know, it's the same for the English clubs. You know, you know, obviously. Witness or Wakefield or whoever it might be, compared to say Salford, they're bringing young players through, and Salford aren't because they haven't got the academy. Now, obviously, there's no rules against Salford, and you know it's no slight on Salford for doing that. But the the point I'm the point I'm trying to make is it's like you've got to compete. You've you've it's no use Witness having a great academy and then finishing bottom of the league and getting relegated, is it? It's, you've got to be able to have the players to compete, and I think that's where Catalan have they've they've sort of found that balance. I mean, it'd be nice to have better. You know, I think it's a travesty that Escaré doesn't play for them anymore. I think that's a travesty because I think the best French players should be playing for Catalan. But then, but then at the same time, on the flip side of that, it is good actually to see more French players playing elsewhere. A bit like the London thing, really. It's good when you see Londoners. Calf scars, walk sergeants, and players like that. There's a lot more to come, though. I yeah, mean, do you know what I mean? No. We've heard of like the likes of Daniel Einmarsh coming through that system now. So he's like, and he had a great game at, at Witness yeah, a couple of weeks. He's ago. like the next level, and this for me is what Catalans are hunting for. It's that next level. So we already know that Guijo is a match winner. We already know that on his day, if he plays and he's given the opportunity, you put the ball in the hands of uh, Vincent Dupont and he'll score a try for you. Yeah. But it's it's the guys that are gonna step up and step in, isn't it? Yeah, as, th- as as witness have found to, at their cost, yeah, and I mean, it's been difficult to do that and juggle it. But so. I th- like I say, I think, I mean, obviously, no, nobody knows, but I think if Toulouse were to get in, I just think it just, it just steps up the intensity a bit because Catalan have got to be better. They've got to... Because ultimately, if there's a good French kid and Catalan don't want it, he signs for Toulouse. Some of the players that Toulouse have got that... You know, really impressed. You know, Stan Raban's one. You know, that, that was at, that was at William Bartow. He's gone there. Bartow. You know, he played at the Broncos and stuff. And there's 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 players kicking around that actually, if Catalan don't give them a chance, and then they go, what if they go off and be a, a big success at Toulouse? Do you know what I mean? That could happen. And I think that's one of the. You know, you see, you see. I mean, Wigan obviously a good example of a, of a club that churns out loads and loads of players. It's almost as if. You know, imagine if imagine if Wigan had a good player that they could just discard because they know he's not going to be picked up by anyone because there's no rivals. Whereas, it, you know, if Wigan had, you know, a player coming through and they discarded him and then Saints picked him up and he was great, Wigan would be like, hang on, we can't let that happen again. I'm actually really intrigued because domestically, the game in France is on its backside. I mean, well, I mean, it's... No, I mean, you look at it, and they've had the equivalents of the Magic Weekend. I think they've had three or two in this past season. And they've took it to the Stade Albert de Mec, which only has a a capacity of 5,000. So, you know, for for me, that is like exactly like we have this conversation regarding the Championship and going to Blackpool and all this type of stuff, where they can't sell it out. The game's on the bones of its backside, I think, away from those two professional teams in France. Well, I think, I mean, I think this is also part of the issue with the old overseas situation is surely Rugby League, let you come in in a minute, Drew, on this, but... Surely, for rugby league to grow, it needs a strong French league. It's pointless having one league over here with a shed load of overseas teams in. Surely, we need to have a better French league. You know, in 
50 years or whatever, how long it's going to take, have a North American league. Do you know what I mean? And for me, I think that's, that, that's almost the problem with the Catalan conundrum at the moment is should we Catalan not? and Toulouse go back and play in the French league? Or should we have them both in the Super League? Because at the moment, what's worked? It's not really. It, it's worked I, to an extent. I, I disagree with you, though, James, because I think it's. How, how long would it take to have a competitive French league? But, uh, with the, with the, say if Catalans and Toulouse did go back to to the French league, how long would it take for, ne- for the never, rest of the never gonna, teams like Lemieux and Carcassonne? You'd but, have a Rangers and Celtic thing going on all the time, well, wouldn't you? That, in that no, division. But, no, but that that's no, but that's fine. But I think it's but, it's, but, it's unrealistic to expect that you know even even Toronto and whoever you want to add Toronto or New York. I for me, it's unrealistic to expect every team that you're going to put into the league to get to a level of a Wigan or a St. Helens. It's just, it's just unrealistic, I think. Toronto might do all right. They might not. We don't know. They've got a guy funded it. That's fine. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but look at looking football, look at Cardiff City and Swansea City. Why do they play in the, the English leagues then? Well, yeah, that, well, I mean, that's a long... It, no, it's, no, because, that... it's because it's not as competitive. It, there's no other teams who can compete to their level. In that, but in that's that more of a that's more of a long-standing traditional type thing. I think I think Catalans was a different setup entirely because if I recall that they came about it because a, merge, a, a couple yeah, of yeah. sides merged, didn't yeah. they? I remember Centre well, Stev, for example, back I, in the mid nineties, and the, dominated. That's the uh, ideally, reserve grade now, yeah. isn't it? What yeah. ideally you want is I think I think you know I still think you have you potentially have the French teams in Super League, but you need to try and find a way that you can connect the French league in. I know we had the Anglo-French Cup thing a few years ago, but oh, you're going back more than yeah, a few yeah. years there. Um, I think I had long hair at the time that was they, going on. No, but I think they just they just need to uh, they just need to fi- figure a way it can be joined up because I think you know are we really expanding and getting anywhere if there's no if we're just saying oh well, we've got two French franchises but nothing else. I like quite like the uh, Chevrolet. Chevaliers, what's it ever called? Which was Lemieux, Lesignon and um, Carcassonne, was it? I yeah, they combined, didn't they? They were and they playing play friendly, friendly, weren't they? they play yeah. friendly against uh, Catalan most years. And, and I, I, just and wanna, I, I just want to hear your French accent together. Oh, yeah. if, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, we've gone on off a massive tangent. We need to talk about the cup final. But I, for me, it's just like, whatever we do, it's like there needs to be a, a plan to expand and not just... Not just bring a team in that replaces a, a, another Stop team. Stop it! You're on your expansion bandwagon again. You've jumped exercise. straight on it. You know we've yeah. got these we, we, we've got these trains going through outside, and you've you've gone on to expansion city. Yeah. Let's get off. Let's, let's talk, go back. Talk about, let's, talk about, let's go let's back talk to the cup Warren, final. Let's talk about okay, Warrington, yeah. uh, Warrington. Let's concentrate purely on Warrington. The job that Steve Price has done. Good job so far. Oh, magnificent! Yeah, he's, he's done a very good job since since he came in. Especially when you you look back on where they were last year under under Tony Smith. I know time time was kind of coming to a very very stop and start, wasn't it last year for for Warrington? They started the season pretty well, and then they just faded off. And then I think the belief just just went completely towards the end of the season. Then it was announced that Tony Smith were leaving. And then Steve Price has come in. He's, he's done a great job he, in, in the league. He's, it took a took a good couple of weeks to get going, didn't it? They, they had up and down results. It took a few weeks. It time to gel. It took kind of most of the first three months of the yeah, season. Yeah, really. and, and it, it was a slow start for Tyrone Roberts. I think it gets a, a lot of uncalled for criticism now, though, because I think when I've arrived, watched Warrington in the last maybe two or three months, he's, he's done a, a very good job in the halves, and it he, he can come up with a, a very good piece of individual. Well, you've got a release. slightly different view than I have about Tyrone Roberts, no, because I, I, I just feel that if you're paying the sort of money that allegedly he's getting paid, he should be your oh, man. Oh yeah, man, I, I'm, and I, I'm, it, I'm on a, He should be able to uh, organise yeah, a lot get, more than he is doing. I get what you're saying though with the marquee. Thing and I completely, completely agree with you. But I think if say, say if he came through the Warrington ranks and he's playing like he is now, I, th- I think a lot of people will have a different view on him. But I, I do see what you mean with the the marquee contract. I, I think he came over here thinking it'd be a lot easier than it is. That was my impression. Don't a lot of Australian players do that. Um, well, p- possibly, but you know, from you know, there's nothing wrong with being confident and arrogant and whatever because you almost sort of you know everyone wants a cocky little half back don't they doesn't work for Bradford um, every time they come up against Workington they always say they're going to batter him and they've lost <laughs> twice to him but I think Roberts was like you know he, he, he you know I, I spoke to him pre-season and he was going to score loads of tries and he was going to set up loads of tries and obviously everyone says that in pre-season but he's just he's just flattered to deceive I think you're right though I think Drew is right I think he does get a little bit of criticism because people have like 
not stereotype, that's not the right word, but people have sort of made their minds upon him and have decided he's not good enough. And so even when he has a good game, it's like, oh, he's finally had a good game sort of thing. I mean, Warwick were dead ropey at the start of the season. They were. Um, you know, I remember watching them at Huddersfield and they were they were dreadful. But I think they, you know, we talk about Catalan having a bit of a hangover from the World Cup. I mean, it's worth mentioning that you know Warrington had a few players at the World Cup as well. And you know, with new co- that couldn't have helped the new coaches. You know, new coaches only getting his key players back after Christmas. And um, and there's an old saying as well, isn't there? The new coach sweeps clean. Yeah. So you know, so you're looking at Price has gone over there, chomping at the bit to get started in November, and he's. His, his key players aren't there because you know Kevin Brown's not there, you know Chris Hill's not there, Ben Curry's not there. You know, and it, do you it, think this is why someone like uh, Deck Patton has been rewarded with another contract because he's been there all the way through? He seems to have, you know, not caused any hysterionics when he's been sent on loan to Rochdale. He's come back in. I think he's done a solid job in and around that sort of eighteen-man squad that Warrington's had for much of the season. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's difficult. I, th- I think it's difficult because there's not many players kicking around. I honestly think it's difficult because for that reason. And I think, I think to be fair, they've got Morgan Smith, who's who's meant to be. The, yeah, like, the, the he's a very good thing. player. Yeah, yeah. And, good I don't, player. You know, we've seen him a few times in championship, haven't we? But I think, I think the thing is, is you almost when you've got your academy lads that you've got, who because Patton's got, he's got a bit of Super League experience now. It's worthwhile if you can afford it. It's worthwhile keeping him around because. You know, there's not a massive market for players, and and the thing is, is because we, you know, because we've got, you know, Toronto, I guess, are a good example because we've got more part, uh, full-time teams outside of Super League paying more money. Might not have if it continues. Well, yeah, but 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 because you, you've got them teams paying more money, it means that players who maybe aren't as good as you think are commanding more money. So it's like you know, someone like Patton might be able to get a big money deal. Gareth O'Brien might be a good example of this. Gareth O'Brien could probably get far more money at Toronto than Warrington would be willing to pay him. Mm-hmm. Do you see what I mean? As an, as an extreme example. And so when Warrington have got kids who've come through, I think, and I think Warrington need to do this because I think that, I, I know I've said it before, the big difference between Warrington compared to Leeds Saints and Wigan is the academy, is the quality of player that they're bringing through. And I think that's a genuine reason they've not made it, they've not won Super League. But if you look, they are starting to turn the corner a little bit. We've I mean, seen lads like Livette coming in, haven't we? Yeah, He's I mean, done a great you know, job. Levette, we'd seen Livette for Rochdale a few times, and you know he, he, looked, he looked all right, but he didn't look, you know, he just looked a bit average. And then he had a couple of great Super League games, and all of a sudden everyone's talking about him like a world beater, and it was it was unbelievable how he just overnight became like a. But a, I mean, a top well, what, what, in the in the press release, Warrington actually said they had an NRL interest in in yeah, Livette, and, after and it just it just sort of happened from nowhere. But I don't think that's a bad thing because I think. You know, Philbin's a good example. I think Philbin is a player. He's like, he's like a player that Wigan have, where because Wigan bring kids through their system, and you know, Sean Wade's a massive advocate of this. When Wigan bring players through the system, they bloody they, they bleed Wigan. You know, they want to, and I think Philbin, a percentage of Philbin's ability. You know, he's not the best player in the world, but you probably get 10, 15, 20 percent extra out of him because he's a Warrington lad and he's come through Warrington Academy. And that's, I think, what Warrington have been missing over the years. And I think that's why they almost need to suck it up a little. Even if Levet or Patton or Philbin aren't good enough or they don't perceive them to be good enough to be first teamers, I think they should just try and stick with it for a few years and just see what happens. Because it, it's important for them that they're able to match the Leeds, Saints, the Wiggins, who have got seven or eight players, key players, that have come through the academy. Well, I, th- I think... Declan Patton has still got massive potential, if I'm honest. I remember doing a, an opinion piece. I got quite a lot of stick for it, actually. Did um, you? What? That's tell not, us, that's not, not tell like us Drew. Tell but us what he's, he's had a... You've been caught in controversy Can we have a... We should have a section for Drew's mishaps because he was getting grief off Michael Carter, the Wakefield chairman, last night. Oh, was he? For not including Bill Tupu uh, in, his, uh, in his team of the week. You an, didn't it, include it, Bill Tupu? No. He should be in the team of the year, never mind the team of the back week. Back to Warrington. Back to Warrington. No, he should get in Super League Dream Team I absolutely agree with you, like, with you on that one sorry but, I diverted back to Warrington yeah yeah I did, a, I, I, did a, I did a piece and I, I was basically saying because after after Tyrone Roberts it was announced that he'd be, he'd be going back to Australia and they, had, they hadn't announced Blake Austin at the time and I did a piece saying give him the number 7 shirt next year because 
His kicking is unbelievable. When he's when Declan Patton is on form, his kicking is unbelievable. He's a great goal kicker as well over the stick. So if he if he was starting, he'd be a, your number one goal kicker. It won't, but because this season they're switching it between Goodwin, Ratchford, Roberts, Roberts has had a few. See whoever gets the first in tip. Even Warrington. Ben Westwood took one at uh, uh, <laughs> uh, ball to the goal. Less said about that one, the uh, better. Um, Dave would have kicked that one. But, uh, but I, I, honestly, I really rate him. And, and Avi Lavette and Joe Philbin have been massive for Warrington this year. You've, you've got Phil who comes off the bench and is an absolute he, he fires through teams at times doesn't he it's he, took him a long while to get in that team regularly hasn't it Philbin yeah because he, he was on the brink for a few years mm. he was in, a, in and out of the team for a couple of seasons and, and this season I think I don't know is it, is, is it being a forward and, and having to, to fill out fully and, do, and develop I, properly I, th- I'm, I'm I, think sure. th- I think Philbin is a player that his heart has got him where his desire has got, you know, there's players, you know, you get naturally talented players, don't you? And I think Philbin, his desire, his work rate, you know, his want to make it has actually helped him. And I, and I, and like I said before, I think, I don't think if he was playing for someone else other than Warrington, I don't think he'd be as good. And so, I think, I think that that sense of pride and whatever for playing for your hometown team and for coming through the academy, I think that just gives you a little bit. And I, I honestly think that's the same with a lot of the Wigan lads. I, I think it's the same about Sean Wayne as a coach. I think Sean Wayne's passion for Wigan gives him an extra 10 20% that he'll only ever be able to deliver as a coach for Wigan. He'd never be able to deliver it as a coach somewhere else. And I think, because, you know, you've got to have a bit of heart, a bit of fight about it. I mean, look what they're doing, these guys. They're crashing into, like, massive blokes, you know, week in, week out. You've got to have... It's 20 mile an hour collisions, yeah, isn't you, it? And I think 20, 30 of those a yeah, game. You've got to have the desire to be able to do that every week. And, uh, you know, I think if, if Warrington can keep that going... You know, Mike Cooper's a great example for them now, I think. I think Cooper's really kicked on. I think, I think a lot of us were surprised. Do you put that down to his stint in Australia where he became a, a regular first I think, he's, first I think he's matured quite a lot, but I think Cooper's another example. Of I, think, I think Cooper's better now than, than what he yeah, was before think, he went to I Australia. I think Cooper's a good example because I think a lot of people were surprised when he got the NRL gig. Well, uh, even, even I remember reading an interview that he did, I can't remember who it was with, but uh, he said something like, if it felt like a, a kid going to to a completely different school in, in like year seven on his on his first day because no one knew who we were. Yeah, and and everyone was like, "Who's who's this lad? Is he is he going to just play a second string or is he here for the for the first grade?" And, and that's quite good, that though, isn't it? I suppose because you've got that challenge. Cause yeah. You've got you've that challenge is in front of you because I mean he could have hung around at Warrington, got carried on, just appearing off the bench and making twenty five appearances a season, but he challenged himself. Didn't yeah, he? And, and it's great. Like he's miles better for it. But I think again, he's another one where his desire and his his almost like his mental strength mm-hmm. has, has got him to where he is and he he now for me is much more important to Warrington than Chris Hill is and that's a you know that's a for him to have got to that position I'd be very surprised if Cooper doesn't end up being the captain now he's about three years younger um, as well so I think that always helps yeah, you know that yeah, he, he has you know, got that little bit longer and, and but, probably a bit but, more mileage left in the tank but also the thing with Cooper is he's a genuine he's, he's now genuinely a top class player that Warrington can hang the hat on and say to Philbin Look what we've done for Mike Cooper. He's come from Warrington's Academy. He's gone to the NRL. He's come back here. He's potentially going to win trophies. You know. To, to, to be fair, if you're putting Chris Hill on the knackers yard, you'll have a queue of Super League clubs. And it, no, come, not, come back not, to I'm league, not, Chris. I'm not, I'm not you know right. you're always wanted. I'm not writing off Chris Hill. Not, I, it's more of a case that it's more of a case of Cooper's elevated him, himself to Hill's level mm. rather than than Hill Hill going down. So a bad front row that is it, Mike Cooper, Chris Hill, and, and, and Carlisle. Well, that's I it. I'm, I, I mean, was only mischief making. So I mean, you talk about Pat and what about Kevin Brown? So I mean, Kevin Brown's deals up, isn't it? At the end of the year, he went to Warrington to win to win trophies. So this is. His first chance at it, I guess. He's got to I, sign on again. I hasn't think he? It, I think he will. I think he will sign on again. I've, I've, I think, I think I heard a couple of weeks ago that he'll, he'll be, he'll be staying at Warrington for, for next season because if you, you've got to think as well. They need continuity. Obviously, Declan Patton is going to be there. Morgan Smith's probably still going, still going to be at Warrington next year. You've got Blake Austin coming in, but Blake Austin this year has played most, of, most of the NRL season at centre for, for Canberra. Mm. But obviously, they're, they're bringing him in as, a, as an halfback, so I, I'd assume. They'd sign Kevin Brown on for another one, maybe two years, and and they'll play him and uh, Austin in the halves, and they'll just keep playing passing like they are doing now, where he's, he, co- he sometimes comes sort on at half back, yeah. comes on at uh, comes on at nine. Okay, yeah. So I, th- I think I think that's the way they'll go. I think 
Ke- to be fair, Kevin Brown's another one as well f- for me who comes under a lot of criticism when he doesn't really do a hell of a lot wrong. I know James is a is a witness fan and he would have seen a lot more the more of Kevin Brown than what I have. But I think the, some of the stuff he, he gets he gets called on social media and everything. I, and I, I don't I don't even think he's a bad player. I think he's a good player. I, I well, think he's a smart I, organizer. That's one opinion. I, I, You've seen a lot of him. You've probably I, seen about nearly every game that he played for witness. Yeah, I mean. I, I don't think there's any doubt that Kevin Brown's a good player. Uh, I think the thing with Kevin Brown, and he, again, a bit like Roberts last season, is Warrington signed Brown, and you know he had a slow start like Roberts did, and it's almost like people decided, or, or Warrington fans decided he wasn't good enough, and then that's just sort of stuck. I think with Kevin Brown, and from what I hear from speaking to a lot of people, is that it's not just what he brings on the pitch, it's what he brings off it as well. So, you know, Witness have obviously capitulated since Brown left, and I understand that one of the reasons for that is he was such a good sort of captain, if you like. He was quite a good connection between the players and the coaching staff, and, and once... You've sort of, once witness lost that, that's when they they'd started to crumble a little bit because you know in terms of you know uh, uh, admittedly they lost Brown, which was obviously a blow on the pitch, but generally speaking, the squad wasn't isn't terrible terribly. It might be a little bit this season, but last season's squad wasn't terribly worse than the season prior, um, and so I think it's the whole round package with Kevin Brown, and you know there's a reason why he, he played. You know he started for England at the, in the World Cup final, you know for Wayne Bennett. You know, and and, and at, even at this age, you know he's at he's at the end of his career. You know, he's getting to the end of his career. He's carried Huddersfield. He's carried Witness. He's at Warrington, where he's perhaps playing a different sort of role. But you know, look where they are. You know, it, it's not so bad. It, you know, like I say, Brown and Roberts are the two starting halfbacks, and they're getting criticised every week, and yet they're in the cup final and challenging for the for the grand final. And it's like, well, what more do you want? It's almost like you almost need to ask. What do you want? You know, what are you expecting to happen? Did it? Did it? What do Warrington expect to happen? Did he want to go back to the days where they were a one-man team and just had Lee Brees kicking all the goals and, and scoring all the points and they were finishing mid-table? Is that what they want? You know, I don't know. Uh, I've I've always been a, a big fan of Kevin Brown, even being truthful. I've always thought he's been a very tidy halfback. He's got that brilliant pass on him, which you must have seen sort of like six hundred times at Witness. Cause he used to do it about half a dozen times a game, didn't he? Seen a few interceptions. Yeah. No, I, I mean I might start a campaign for Kevin Brown to be player coach at Witness next season. Oh, <laughs> what's an interesting? If, if, if Warrington don't, do you think him. he'd ever come back? I don't know. Maybe he's player coach. Depends what the money is. Yeah. Well, he said, he said he left Witness because he wanted. To, trophies, to win yeah. trophies, we might go back next year so and try and, try and win the championship <laughs> with Witness. Yeah. We're only two There's games into blood. that, Tail. Co- come on, blood. Dave. No, it's come the, on, witness Dave. Done, Dave. Witness are done. They're done. They're, they're yeah, done. I th- to be honest, uh, that, would, that Witness it, team would only finish halfway still down got the championship. Still got to Toronto and Toulouse. No, with, but I don't are, think Witness will make a million pound game. We are diversifying yet again because this has meant to have been the cup final special, hasn't it? So we do seem to have the cup final's been on now, hasn't it? Yeah, we do. We do seem to have run its course in previewing the cup final predictions. Come I've, on, I've, Drew. I think Warrington will win. I will. I do think War- I, it'd be a nicer story if Castellans won. Don't get me wrong, and I think a lot more people would be happy because every, I think everyone will have a Castellans shirt on, a, or a French flag, or a Catalonian flag in the in the room uh, on Saturday. But I think Warrington will be too strong, and I think Warrington by go for eighteen, three tries, three converted tries. I was thinking, I was thinking Warrington by sixteen, so they're going to miss one of the goals at usually. I think, I think it'll probably, I think it'll be one of them where I think it'll be a close first half, but then as soon as Warrington break, you know, as soon as Warrington break, Catalans resolve and get maybe one, a couple of scores in front. I think it'll end up being Warren a bit almost similar to the Leeds game, uh, the semi final where Warrington will get ahead and then be able to keep them at arm's length, and there'll probably be a lot of tries scored and. Um, and I, I mean, like I say, I mean, like you say, I mean, I think, I think it, you know, it'd be it'd be nice for Catalan to win from a Catalan point of view. But then that's you know, it'd be nice for Warrington to win from a Warrington point of view because they've you know, it's always nice when you see if you compare if you look at where Warrington were ten years ago, mm-hmm. they've now won, they've now, and people forget this, you know, Warrington have now five cup finals in ten years. Prior to ten years ago, they've not been anywhere. For ages, you know, and if I think you it was look, 1990 when they played Wigan, wasn't it? And yeah, that was and the you, last cup final, if you like. You know, and it, uh, you know, and you, and you just like, 
if you look at where they've gone as a club, they they're now an established part of the rugby league elite. But fifteen years ago, they weren't. They, they were, you know, they were a bottom half team, you know, and, and they've shown, you know, Warrington's the bottom half last year. Well, yeah, but you know what, you know what I'm getting at. Warrington's a big town compared in comparatively. So Warrington's big in comparison to you know a Widnes or a Castleford or or places like that. But they've still shown that in this midst of expansionism and all that that well, could they're, right, they're right the right teams can establish themselves and uh, you know and, and do well and we always talk about we want different teams to win things so I suppose it would be nice for Catalan to maybe maybe Catalan winning the Challenge Cup and Warrington winning the Super League that'll uh, that'll, that'll tick both boxes then because then you've got another winner and of both it's uh, it's three lots for Warrington because I'm tipping Warrington to win by 20 points. So I think they're going to have a real comfortable afternoon. But then again, my tipping has been off all season. If you've seen where I am, oh, folks, my, I'm lower than you. In I think. the tipping league, I think you've actually just got ahead of me. Oh, now. have I? Yeah. So I've I, been I'm struggling. dreadful. I'm about I think the only, eighth bottom. I think the only people below me are ones who've missed a few weeks. I think mine's been that bad. But I, I see. I it's like you tip witness win every week. <laughs> no, I know. I don't. I don't. I think uh, I think my problem is I always I always have a faith that someone's going to cause some sort of upset. Um, I think I think sorry. I think the last words on the final the, the first half's massive uh, mo- the most important for for Warrington if if Warrington are ahead at half time I think the, the game's done then depending on, obviously on 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 what scoreline it is but it's it's whether they can weather the the Catalan storm that the. the the pack will, will make, I think. The, the Catalans pack will come out firing like they did against Saints. If Warrington can, ca- Warrington can calm it down, then I think they'll, they've got the, the win in the bag. What about um, the crowd? We, we haven't we haven't spoke about that. Oh, uh, well, hang I've, fire, hang fire, because I think that's a, a point that you've raised there and through what we've already spoken about were... Um, you can have your say, really. So get listing. We want to find out what you think. Do you agree with our predictions? Do you think it's going to be a comfortable afternoon for Warrington? Or are you going to be sat there with your French flag and your, your baguette sort of waiting for a positive result? Right, let's... let's, let's sort talk of about the crowd quickly. Talk about the crowd. Uh, well, it can be as... You can draw it out as long as you want, so, really, I to mean, be honest. There's, a, there's obviously concerns about the crowd, but to be honest, I, I just think we get too caught up in it. I, I just don't think it's an issue myself. I, I think, yeah, it'd be great if it sold out. Let's be honest, but it's going to be, be difficult to get to London anyway. We used well, to be Let's sure. face it, we're, we're, we're all on about this hashtag let's fill Wembley thing and all, all this, let's fill it. When was the last time Wembley were full for a Challenge Cup final? I think, I mean, I spoke to, I mean, Phil, Phil Kaplan, mm-hmm. um, great advocate for rugby league, great guy. I had a bit of Twitter exchange with him this morning um, where, you know, we were sort of saying, well, if rugby, league, if rugby league fans can't get behind the events, you know, why should anybody else? But and, then again, and I think, then again, you say this and we keep banging the drum for, and the interest isn't there. No, well, I think these I think, days it's, no, but I think, it's changed. I think, I think that the, dynamic has no, changed. No, but I don't think it's necessarily a problem with the cup final. It's just the volume of people. I don't. It, I it's think not people, anybody's fault. I, I think fans have changed. I but, think because yeah, you the, don't the, want to go watching no, some well, random yeah, teams well, yeah, no, fight the, out the, if it's, you've no interest. The in point it. I made. The point I made to Phil was: you're now expecting people to go Magic Weekend, Challenge Cup Final, Super League Grand Final. You expect them to go to France three times, Canada once, and possibly Australia if you support a big enough team. Each season, and you it's need like, a mortgage every year. Yeah, you know, and it's like the, to go to the cup final is quite expensive. In theory, you could probably save your money from the cup final and go to Catalan away next year. That's what you could do. And I think, I think the problem is it's not the the final. I mean, I think the final should be earlier in the year, but that's another debate. I don't think it's the actual final. It's the problem. It's just the volume of people. What's the average Super League attendance every weekend? Fifty, uh, fifty thousand, fifty, sixty thousand in total, and yet. We're moaning when Wembley can't be filled at ninety thousand for a one for one game on Bank Holiday weekend in August. Uh, uh, and let, let, let's just make it clear: since the 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 RFL bought Club Wembley back, that's an extra. I can't remember specifically, but I think it's about twenty thousand seats. That and before last before twenty sixteen, I think it were when uh, Wigan played. No, it was Hull. Anyway, can't it was re- one of them. It yeah. was two thousand and sixteen. Anyway, can't, can't yeah, remember yeah, the yeah. game, but. Because of the twenty thousand club Wembley, because no what no there's not many Southerners who'll go to oh. uh, get the get the one for for Club Wembley. No, just as an example, there's 
Whereas they'll pack it out for when England play an home game against Estonia or something like that. They'll pack it out and, and Club Wembley will be full. No, not many of them, them people who have Club Wembley memberships go to the Challenge yeah. Cup final, but that 20,000 was always counted on top of the final attendance, so it always looked like there was... It's 80. like having season tickets, well, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Included, exactly they yeah. always boost your crowd. I honestly... And you, always got, you always got figures like 82,000, 83,000, but it wasn't. It was six... I th- I think last year it was 64,000. So I think if we can get over 50,000 this year, that's a massive effort. I honestly and, don't... And fair play to them Catalan fans for selling 3,500 tickets. Yeah, because, I, I mean, to get to London that's from France effort. at two weeks' notice is difficult. It's I more don't difficult think... getting from Warrington well, as well, yeah, down yeah. to London, I think, isn't it? I don't it's see the right. issue, and I, and I still say this, about I say it about the grand final as well, because obviously the ticket price you know, always gets caught, and you know there's always all sorts of stuff. You know, like Warrington fans are buying tickets for fifty quid, and the next day they're on Groupon for a five, and it's like, you know, it's a nightmare. I think why is it an issue that there might be forty thousand there? I just don't see it as an issue. I think yeah, okay, look, but it's just it, it looks bad on TV, you might say, but that's just the reality of the situation. I think. You sell 40,000 tickets at full price. This year you've got 40,000. Next year you try and get more than 40,000. It's simple as that. Whereas at the moment we're in this, we're in this thing where you might have 80,000 people there paying half price, which is worse than having 40,000 people there having full price. I'm going to chuck opinion. something in here because I think that there's a historical element and I think that the Challenge Cup has been put on the back burner in a lot of people's minds since this game went to summer. So I'm taking it back to 96. I always feel that because Super League became the be all and end all, and you had um, you had chairman going giving away season tickets for eighty quid, I think it was for, for the likes of Huddersfield. I'm not sure. I, I think people it's don't more, want to pay anymore. I think it's more Magic Weekend than Super League. I think 100 Magic Weekend. Yeah, I weekend think it's more. Effect. I don't think it's Super League that's been the issue. I think it's Magic Weekend. I think because uh, I still think you know I'm you know I was a kid in the nineties, so the Challenge Cup to me, even though Super League was still had, the Challenge Cup to me still had that thing that everyone still seems to go but it's since Magic Weekend because Magic Weekend's become because it's all about the neutral element isn't it that's what we're saying because because well, each individual look, team you do look and you sort of if you examine all the figures of crowds if you look pre-95 Challenge Cup crowds were always your highest for whoever in the season in the rounds you mean yeah. in the rounds you'd, you'd then get 78,000 at Wembley yeah. everyone seemed to be happy with that I think that there's too, maybe too many events for people to... So it does come in with that. But I also think it comes down to people maybe not having as much m- money to spend. No, well, I mean, obviously, the mo- you know, money's, you know, money's tight for everyone. And, I, think, um, I think as well, Wembley, in, it's 25th August, around that time every, every year, isn't it? So, And I think, especially from people going up from the north, it's an absolute ball ache to get there for, on on this date in the year. On, yeah. the, on, on the bank holiday on the bank holiday weekend, prices go up, prices go up for trains, prices go up for hotels, B&Bs and all that. It's, it's so expensive. It, say it's, uh, the offices, these offices are in Warrington, so say if, if you're going from Warrington to uh, to Wembley this weekend, you, you know, the cheapest you'd probably get is the National Express coach. No one wants to be on a coach for... How, how long in total? In yeah, 12 I, th- hours, I, th- I think. I think. I think. I think. Um, I, I think. From from my point of view, the Magic Weekend, because you go into see if you're a Super League, we're, the Wembley's reliant on neutral fans because no club has got enough fans to fill half a Wembley. So, for the Challenge Cup final to have a decent crowd, it needs neutral fans. But the problem is that, that now is that. Those neut- the, the rugby league event that used to be for neutral fans, them neutral fans are now spending their money going to watch their team at Magic Weekend. And if you're a St. Ellen's fan or a Witness fan or, or Uddersfield, are you going to spend your money going to watch your team at Magic Weekend? Or are you going to save it to go to Wembley when potentially your team might not play? And I, I think Magic Weekend is the big issue there. I mean, and, I, you know, and the problem is with Magic is that, that it is a weekend, so it's... You, People stay over for two nights yeah. rather than one at Wembley. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's yeah. double the price. But effectively. I, I do I do think we waste so much time going over stuff like this. Where you know what I'm, I think, I'm, well, a, I know, I'm agreeing what, with what, you. What are you on there? Six I'm hours? agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. how long have some, we got? I think someone. I think someone. I seen a tweet actually the other day where someone said um, rugby league so nar is it narcissistic? Narcissistic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, and and you're right. We're always like. 
we're always so insular, worried about what we look like or what we're doing instead of just no, getting I, on with it. The sport I would, is I about would, playing rugby. That's it. That's all it needs. You know, you don't I need would, to worry about things. It's like it's about playing rugby. And if people like watching us play, watching the teams play rugby, they'll come and watch. There's nothing. Like, if they don't like it, they won't come. You can't manufacture it. Can I just get opinions on uh, on? Andy Burnham presenting the the trophy after uh, after Neil Fox uh, rejected the well and the Royals the of course and the Royals. It. I mean, they, they asked Dave, but he's busy. They asked me, but so I'm... they went to the second the second most popular man in Lee, which is why Andy Burnham got it. <laughs> what you mean they didn't ask Riddy? <laughs> Not Martin Ridyard would have been somewhere Rid- on no, that Rid- list. Rid- yeah. I'm ch- uh, that, if the Ke- if the Kevin Brown to witness thing doesn't come off, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna start a campaign to get Ridyard at witness. There you go. Well, there's there's one for you, Dave. Ridjar's going back laying to Dave. Uh, <laughs> if he leaves Featherstone, uh, I, I don't know. Ridjar, come on, <laughs> please, please, lad, go on. All's forgiven. <laughs> I'll play you six it every wasn't single week. It wasn't his fault. All's forgiven. Wait, that's another part. That's another episode in itself. That is another episode. The unraveling of Lee. We could Should do that the in the off-season. Final state at Wembley. Yeah. Do you you know what? I would, I would take it. I would take but it from where? Wembley. But I would have thought you would have kept it. At no, Wembley, no, no, no. I'll I, take I'd it. I'd only move it. I don't. The only reason I'd move it from Wembley is if the RFL end up with a national stadium like Twickenham. I would keep it at Wembley because I think it, Cardiff. Lo- I th- no, I think you'd lose even more f- speckies then. Cardiff. No, I think you'd, you'd lose sell it. it out. No, you wouldn't. Yeah, you would. Yeah, I'm positive regarding that. Look, at, I'm, I'm, I'm look more at intrigued. To, I'm more intrigued there. to go Wembley than Cardiff. You're right. No matter in the te- which you're team right in the city centre, aren't you? What did he do with the statue? If we move it to Cardiff, did the statue go from Wembley to Cardiff? I can stay in. Can stay at Wembley. It's a big part of history. As long as rugby league doesn't become history, Dave. Well, yeah, there is that about it. Hopefully it doesn't. <laughs> um, otherwise, what are we going to talk about every hour when we turn up? Well, I know we'll have to go and get proper jobs. <laughs> <laughs> you would. You would. Are we good? I think that we're good, yeah. So thank you for joining us on this, the uh, Love Rugby League Weekly. It's great to be back, slightly different format. We'll be back again next week. Uh, wherever you're watching the final, if you're going to be there, if you're not and you're going to be moaning at the trains or anything else that's keeping you away, then uh, we'll leave you to it. Uh, just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. And that's us. Out. <laughs>